Real quick, I just wanted to jump in on this video. I know it's a long one, but I want to let you guys know that the new shirts are live on workforchangepodcast.com. So the shirt that I'm wearing right now, also the shirt that I'm, I'm wearing in m- most of this video, this one right here, it has a really cool design on the back. It says work for change for life or work for change, change for life, as well as we have a female tank as well in black. So a lot of you guys were wondering why we didn't release black stuff at the start. And yeah, that was a dumb decision. So... <laughs> We have the black stuff now. Um, It's available in up to a size 5XL for you guys that are curious. It is a pre-order, but again, I'm super excited. I wanted to make sure that we had, you know, as many sizes as possible. I hope that that's uh, sufficient for everyone out there. Um, But thank you guys so much and enjoy the rest of the video. Okay, so today, first off, I want to say strap in and grab some popcorn or some snacks or something because... (laughs) This is a long video that we're going to be talking about, but this is, and I say this a lot, but this is by far, like far and away, nowhere even close. This is the most requested video I have ever gotten in my, in my discord. Um, So this video is from a uh, fellow YouTuber name is Kiana and uh, she made a video and it is titled the toxic world of Tess holiday and fat activism, politics, lies, and health. Also, thank you so much for ordering a shirt. I appreciate it. Um, And so, again, like I said, this video is 55 minutes long. Um, I'm probably going to speed it up just a little bit because just for brevity's sake. But I do want to watch the whole thing and I want to see what she has to say. So, without further ado, let's watch it. One day, I found Tess Holiday, And Tess Holiday looked amazing to me. People, people like her are really, really changing society and I want to be like her. The way she loves herself and her body and doesn't care what anyone says about it. She inspires me, she motivates me. She had like all this makeup done and her hair was pretty and you know, like she looked so glamorous. I I wanted to be like Tess Holiday. So that's something that you hear a lot about is people that will see um, like Tess Holiday and they will aspire to be like her. Now, I think in general, there's nothing uh, super wrong about that. Everyone has people that they look up to. Where I do think it ends up going wrong is I'm sure where where we will go in this video and what is explained. I haven't seen any of the video at all. Um, but I do think that just looking up to someone and saying they inspire me, that's not a bad thing in and of itself. The Health at Every Size movement, or HAZE, has been around for a long time, but has exploded in popularity over the last few years, with more and more social media posts such as these every day. It's not the fat that kills us, it's the fat hatred. Health status is not defined by weight, so weight loss programs are about aesthetics. Your weight is not the problem, food is not the problem, diet culture is the problem. I'm going to do my best not to... (laughs) interrupt this video too much but just understand that probably the inside of me is screaming at many times (laughs) many times in this video but i'm going to try my best not to interrupt too much i don't have an eating problem i have a fat phobia problem or my personal favorite bmi is government propaganda At the most extreme end, health at every size supporters and fat activists argue that obesity is not dangerous and that bodies naturally come in all shapes and sizes, all the way up to 600 pounds, or what would be called infinity fat, according to them. Some even call the obesity epidemic a myth. They say it doesn't kill people or cause disease. So, and I I think one thing, I I know I said I wasn't going to interrupt too much, but you guys know how I do. So, also, Kiana, fantastic job so far on the editing. Wow. Very good. You are talented. Okay. But the thing that I think that she said that may, might get skipped over by a lot of people is that she said on the extreme end of fat, fat activism and health at every size. I want to make it very clear because I've had conversations with people that consider themselves health at every size or maybe did in the past or something along those lines. Uh, a, lot of peop- a lot of people in that sphere don't all believe this stuff, but it's a big but. There are 
on the extreme ends of the spectrum, those are the loudest voices and those are the ones that we hear the most. And so I do think that it's kind of sad for people that are actual, you know, maybe health at every size activists that are not on the extreme edge ends of the spectrum because they are always going to get lumped in with these people that are the more extreme ends of the spectrum. We hear in the news all the time about an obesity epidemic and how people are dying of obesity. And what we see is that it's just not true. According to them, the diseases we often attribute to obesity, such as diabetes and hypertension, are the result of weight stigma, the psychological pressure of living in a society that mistreats fat people. This thing, this, th oh, this blows my mind, is the people that say, like, diabetes and heart, heart disease and high blood pressure, all of these things, and heart attacks, all this stuff, those aren't the things that are actually killing, um, or it's not the fat that is actually killing someone that is morbidly obese that has those conditions. It's the fact that they have, there's stigma against them that is causing people to die prematurely. That one, I just, I can't sign on to that one at all. And not due to the excess weight itself. Many Hayes supporters go as far as to say that the war on obesity is a form of eugenics. And gastric bypass is, quote, voluntary amputation. And they're campaigning to have the word stricken from the medical literature and classified as hate speech. At this point, you might be saying to yourself, how is it possible that something so preposterous has become almost mainstream? And surprisingly, the answer seems to be Tess Holliday. Today we'll be discussing Tess Holliday, the biggest and most dangerous lie of health at every size, namely that morbid obesity can be considered healthy, and the research or lack thereof that's used to support these claims. I hope you guys enjoyed my double intro. This video actually started off as a way- Girl, you killed it on that intro, alright? Slayed it. Way more casual video, but the more I read and the more I saw, the more I was like, nope. I'm going to drop everything and make this gigantic video about Tess Holiday and health at every size. <laughs> I've labeled everything with timestamps, so if you want to hop around or rewatch stuff, it should be pretty easy to do so. We're going to get into a lot of stuff today, but before we do, I should say a few disclaimers up front. Throughout this video, I'm going to be using the terms fat activist, uh, health at every size supporter, and body positivity person to mean the same thing. There is a distinction between these <laughs> groups, and they're not all you know, harmful, um, but that line is very blurry online, so I'm going to be using them interchangeably during the video. I love, love, love that she said that because, dude, it is so hard, like, when you are talking about health at every size or fat activism or body positivity, they are separate things. They are, and I, they are, they're separate, but the overlap is so severe that it's hard sometimes to separate uh, the people from the groups um, and also I want to say if you're watching this live or if you're watching the video after the fact make sure you go to Kiana's channel it'll be linked in the description go subscribe go watch the video give it a thumbs up because shoot man an hour-long basically documentary for free on YouTube I think that's very cool okay sorry I also want to say that there are definitely people practicing health at every size a lot more reasonably than the depiction you're about to see here I oh Yes. Yes. I went into this video thinking that Hayes was going to be a lot more reasonable than I've seen it portrayed by the extremists online. But I actually ended up leaving it thinking that it was even more harmful than I thought. And you guys are going to see why today. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Tess Holiday made waves in 2015 as the first size 22 model to be signed to a major agency. You know, I, it's something I wanted to do my whole life, right. and everyone always told me I would never be able to do it. Right. They laughed at me, they made fun of me, right. and I don't know if it was like delusion, but <laughs> I just was like, I'm gonna try. Since then, she's been called the world's biggest supermodel, worked with big brands like H&M and Benefit Cosmetics, and named one of the most influential people on the internet by Time Magazine. And by 2018, she had already landed the now infamous cover of Cosmo UK. Did you see the cover of Cosmopolitan magazine that was widely criticized because they had a morbidly obese woman on? Many people say they love the body positive move made by Cosmo UK. 
Others say Tess Holliday is an unhealthy representation. You are, you, you are celebrating. You are celebrating her. morbid obesity. I am not celebrating That's what you're morbid doing. obesity. You want... This cover, this is one cover which has a larger lady on the cover in a sea, in a world, in a culture which has venerated, since I can remember, thinness. Seeing someone like me on the cover of like a glossy magazine shouldn't be top news. They're hailing her as brave. I mean, what's brave about, you know, eating ice cream? She's literally <laughs> morbidly <laughs> obese. She's fucking dying. She's addicted to food in a horrible way. And to promote that and pretend that somehow or another this is okay. Ooh, so I mean, I remember when I remember when this when this went viral. Obviously, I made videos about it. I talked about it, and I I think that for the most part, uh, what a lot of people, what a lot of what they were saying there was probably true. I think maybe a little bit harsh, but knowing Joe Rogan and I know that's Ethan Klein from H3, they're both comedians. Um, I do think that the, it can be, it can be dangerous, um, showing someone that is so large on the cover of a cosmopolitan magazine, but at the same time, like I struggle with this and this is just me being honest. I struggle with this because I do believe that just showing someone like, I think a lot of people will take my thoughts on that and then apply it to anyone that might post a picture on social media. Like, anyone that might post a selfie. Any any larger person that might post a picture of themselves at the beach while they're wearing a bikini. And then they might take that as, okay, now you should go to that person that is just posting for their own, you know, their own enjoyment because they want to live their life and say, hey, you're, you're glorifying obesity or you're going to die soon. You're going to have a heart attack. Like, I don't think I think there is a distinction between a regular person and a public figure. And I think that that's where people sometimes will lose that. Like there is a difference between. A public figure, someone that is putting themselves out there for criticism, uh, they're putting themselves out there, I mean, obviously not just for criticism, but also for praise and for money, right? That's why she does what she does, versus just the person that you might be friends with on Instagram that is posting their body because, you know, maybe they're, they're happy with where they are. I personally think there's a distinction there and there's a difference. Clearly, there were some mixed reactions. Some people saw Tess's cover as a special moment for body positivity while others went as far as to say it was glorifying obesity. The term glorifying obesity is thrown around a lot these days, and not always appropriately. When one third of Ashley Graham was featured on the cover of Vogue, glorifying obesity. When Nike rolled out a plus size mannequin so fat people could exercise, glorifying obesity. Mm -hmm. When Mattel offered up a curvy Barbie, size eight, US medium, glorifying obesity every plus size girl dancing around on tiktok glorifying obesity yeah oh dude she, okay so exactly that's exactly what i mean people will say everything is glorifying obesity when it's like dude this is just a bigger person living their life like not everything is glorifying ob i do think there are some things that are that but not everything is that as you can see there is quite the range here and there is a distinction between being fat and living your life and pretending that obesity is no big deal. Except that in Tess' case, it kind of actually was glorifying obesity for real this time. Yeah, agreed. At 5'5 five five and over 300 pounds, Tess Holliday is by far the biggest model to have ever graced the cover of a major magazine. I've thought about this a lot, and I don't know that it's fair to say that Tess's cover is problematic in of itself. After all, having a particularly admirable or healthy lifestyle hasn't exactly ever been a prerequisite to be a model or celebrity. True. <laughs> True. And in many ways, if you think about it, unhealthy lifestyles have been glamorized forever at this point. Now, is that a good thing? No, none of this is good. But... I think to be disproportionately offended because an obese woman is on the cover of a magazine is, I think, unfair. And actually, Tess had already been on the cover of People magazine in 2015, which by readership is five times larger than Cosmo UK, without nearly the same level of controversy. The difference in outrage seems to stem from the fact that Cosmo felt the need to devote an entire page to declaring that Tess was strong, fit, and 300 pounds. And most of the discussion revolved around her excellent health and workout regime, as opposed to her fight for body positivity and self-love. I know it's been 
putting this off for a little bit and now it's time to talk. My goals are just to feel better and be stronger and also show people that fat girls work out. Okay, so with this, this is a tough one because I believe that everyone, I think that working out in fitness is such a powerful tool for so many people out there. And I truly, truly am happy that Tess is working out. I think that's great. Now, the thing that frustrates me is that it seems like with this, this whole interview, um, this, this whole video and everything, it's, it, it truly felt like it was propaganda. Okay, like propaganda, propaganda to show, hey, I work out and I'm still the size that I am kind of thing. Right. And that is just I believe that that's misleading. And I'm not saying this in a mean way, but when you are as as large as Tess Holiday is, if you are going to start like working out or, you know, like she said, I want to feel better. I want to move better. I want to, you know, feel better in my body. Usually for most people that is going to come with weight loss right? Not saying you have to chase weight loss, but if you're as large as she is and you want to move better and you want to feel better and you take the steps to do those things, most likely you're going to lose weight. That's not a bad thing, but it seems like for her and her brand, that is a bad thing. And that's scary for her because her whole brand is based around the fact that she is large. So if she lost weight, she would probably be afraid of losing followers and losing support, which I think is sad. And like, I don't want that for her. So I, this, this whole interview thing definitely made me cringe a little bit. Showing people that fat girls work out is a big thing for Tess. She chose a famous personal trainer. They both made announcements about it on their Instagram accounts. Um, they shot multiple videos while they were together and they even shot that People TV segment in just the few short months that they were working together. Now, Tess has a running... So this is a great comment from um, Fit Fatty. <laughs> She's uh, I know that she's actually a supporter of health at every size and she uh, I know that she cringes every time I talk about it on stream But uh, she herself right here just said I lost 30 pounds when I adopted Hayes right health at every size and I don't I don't think she's lying I believe her a hundred percent and that's why I say I struggle with these topics because I see the I see that it's valid for people I truly see that especially for women I believe that it, it really can be a valid thing that can help a lot of people out I believe that fully fully believe that and so but I do believe that there are people like I said on the other side of the spectrum that make it harder for people like fit fatty I'm sorry I don't know her real name um that that now they're they have to deal with what these misconceptions people have because of the test holidays or the Virgie Tovars of health at every size sponsorship with Fabletics and since that time I haven't seen any videos of her working out so I guess the photo shoots in athletic clothes are meeting her quota for showing people that fat girls work out because she has totally stopped with that all in all it just feels very contrived to me I feel like it's one thing for Tess Holiday to be on the cover of a magazine for any reason because she validates plus-size women because she's popular because you want to be controversial to sell more magazines whatever but something completely different when cosmo takes a stand to validate tess's delusion that she's healthy to millions of people and then goes as far as to shove it down our throats with three pages about her workout regime as opposed to making the article literally about anything else the problem with this is cosmo just put mainstream media's stamp of approval on one of the most heinous lies of health at every size the preposterous untruth that morbid obesity can be considered healthy. And what about your own health test? Do you ever, you know, because we, we had um, a report very recently in, in yeah. this country saying it's a myth that you can be very overweight, obese and be healthy. So do you worry about your weight? You've got young children. Do you um, worry about your health? Look, I would not go through <laughs> having kids and what it does to your body to not be around for them. You know what I mean? Um, I know that I'm healthy. Being a... Oh, this one's tough too because... When I... <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know why I do this to myself. I, don't, I really don't know why. Um, but like this is a tough one as well because a lot of times when when people say like they are they're healthy, they talk about lab results and they talk about their blood. You know, they got their blood tests and all this stuff. But like I think health is so much more than just what your lab results sell, say, right? And the fact is, is that your lab results, especially you know you're under forty years old, like it's a good chance that you could be severely overweight and still have complete like your blood results are fine like when I was at my heaviest my blood results I never like I didn't even have high blood pressure or anything but I knew that if I stayed at that size for 10 more years maybe even six more years I don't know if I would have been healthy anymore and like when I say healthy I don't know if I would have been able to uh, live a life that I was happy with I, I, I really, I was already at a point where I felt like I was no longer living. I was just existing, but I knew that I was only gonna get worse down that rabbit hole if I continued to gain weight. And it wasn't because of what society was telling me. It wasn't because of what diet culture was telling me. It's what I felt myself inside, regardless of what was going on around me. It was how I felt about myself, and that's what's scary, and that's where I think a lot of people have problems. A healthy, extremely obese person is an oxymoron, point blank, and it is extremely dangerous to suggest otherwise on talk shows and the front of magazines. So this was a caption from one of Tess's Instagram posts, which has since been removed but was cataloged on a website. To say and actually believe, things like, if you're fat, you're automatically unhealthy, is wildly inaccurate. You can absolutely be overweight and be healthy, I know, because I am not, in fact, over 7 feet tall to balance out my weight. So according to my BMI, I'm obese. Which is hilarious to me. Not because I think being unhealthy is funny, but because I'm healthy. Extremely so, in fact. I'm able to keep up with my children perfectly. Uh, so Tess is saying a lot in that statement. First off, most notable being that she's not obese. You don't really just get to opt out of being obese. Unless, you know, there's an issue with BMI and you're not meant to be in that category, which would not apply to this level of obesity. I'm considered obese by BMI standards. <laughs> So, I mean, I try not to, to argue too much with people about BMI because I do think that it's pretty flawed. I do think that for the, the vast majority of people for um, like, quote unquote, like the average person, it's it's I don't want to say it's accurate, but it's helpful. But again, like I've talked to my friend, Sprinson Nadolski, who's an obesity specialist. It's like it's just a tool in the toolbox. It's not everything. But it seems like with um, it seems like with. Uh, health at every size they have latched onto it and have treated it like this is the reason that we're treated this way when I think that there is a lot a lot more that goes into it than just BMI because again I am considered obese by BMI standards like I am I'm I'm 210 pounds and I'm 5'8 I'm, I'm considered obese um, and so when I don't I just don't even try and argue with someone about that because I'm like whatever you you can have that one if you want it or you go and have your fat scanned and you find out that you're actually carrying 200 pounds of muscle. Being able to do essential life tasks, such as watching after your children or stand on your feet all day to do your job, does not prove that you are extremely healthy. Now there's enough data to suggest that you can indeed be overweight and be healthy. But to be fair, there is also data suggesting that no, um, people are healthiest within the normal BMI range and beyond that, you're less healthy. You can make a compelling argument with the data that's out there for either one. But that is not what we are talking about here. Mm -hmm. There are no doctors that I've seen arguing that you can be this obese and be healthy. And I, I agree with that. And I think that I think that it's important to make a distinction between um, overweight and like obese or uh what are the, is it the classes like class one, class two, class three obesity? Um, I think that there, I don't think there is a difference between being overweight and being class three obese. It's not the same thing. And like to the people that might argue that um, you can be cons you can be overweight and be healthy, I would I would probably be like, hey, I agree with you one hundred percent. I agree. I'm on board with that. 
a hundred percent I'm on board. But once you start going up the ladder to type three obese and try to say like you can be this size and still be considered healthy. Um, and if you take it a step further, still be considered healthy in 10 years and 20 years. If you continue to be this size, I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm calling BS on that. This is the equivalent of someone who's like a high functioning alcoholic or a chain smoker saying that because they don't have any issues right now, because they don't have a disease right now that they're healthy. Well, no, you have an addiction. And by Cosmo validating this, by acting like, oh, you know, Tess, she lives a healthy lifestyle. She's just big. It plays into the health at every size narrative that you can be this big and it's not suggestive of you living an unhealthy lifestyle or having a problem with food. You know, you're just born that way. You're just built like that. And unfortunately, Cosmo is not the only one validating Tess's delusions to millions of people. There seems to be this budding corporate trend of discussing health as if it just involves declaring, I am healthy, as opposed to being defined by actively living a healthy lifestyle and not engaging in destructive behavior. Prior to this cover, Tess was actually featured on the front of Self, an actual health magazine, or at least it was a health magazine. I don't know what you would call it today. <laughs> The shade. <laughs> and Health magazine has featured many fat activists as of late, including Virgie Tovar, which if you've seen my video on her, you'll know her definition of health is a little out there. Actually, Virgie recently also said, there is no such thing as individual health. So there you have it. Dog, like, okay, there's not many people that I will just write off and be like, you know what? I'm done caring what they say. But Virgie Tovar, I'm just, yeah. <laughs> this isn't me a no for me, dog. In the land of body positivity, health is so subjective that it basically doesn't even exist. And the corporate world is so desperate to cash in on people's insecurities that they're willing to put feelings over facts and people's health at risk in order to pander. In my opinion though, one of the most empowering discoveries over the last however many years is just how big of an impact our decisions, our actions can have on our, what's called our health span, which is essentially the amount of years we live in our lives in good health free from the chronic diseases that come with aging. And is that not extremely encouraging to the general public? Why would we ever downplay that to any degree at all? This is, as far as I can tell, the definition of glorifying obesity, obscuring the truest reality of the disease of obesity and pretending that it is somehow not a big deal. And mm. although this hypothesis is still unsupported by current research, Moments like these are, are huge for movements like health at every size. And why many of Tess's obese followers believe that Tess is healthy and therefore they're healthy too. It's also why people suddenly feel confident saying things like this. Can this person go back to school please? Or go do some research and not be a fucking idiot? Fat does not equal unhealthy. Get your info straight before you hop on the internet and be an idiot. Now, fat might not equal unhealthy, but being very obese certainly does. So before we discuss the science that fat activists use to support their claims, let's talk a little bit about the cold, hard, and unglamorous reality of obesity. The inconvenient truth in this instance is that at 5'3 and over 300 pounds, Tess Holiday has a BMI of at least 49 and would be considered to have the most extreme form of obesity, class three, formerly known as morbidly obese. At this size, Tess is at risk for over 200 different diseases. Now, and the thing that, the thing that I think that she probably has a problem with, I'm sure she'll bring it up, but like, what scares me about this is like the amount of messages I get now, I, I would say it's almost daily now that I get messages from, for the most part, it's from women that said, hey, I just wanted to say I appreciate your videos because I fell down the, um, you know, the health at every size rabbit hole. I ended up gaining 50 pounds in a year or something like that. And um, I, I, I was really suffering. My health is really going downhill. And, and then they'll say, like, I'm really, I'm really glad that I found your, um, I, I'm really glad that I found your videos because you were able to, sh to show me, um, because, you know, what I try and do in my videos is, yes, I disagree, but I try not to be overly mean about it because I don't think that that's going to help anybody. But I try and share, you know, the facts and obviously my opinions in a way that can help have someone that maybe might believe what uh, Virgie Tovar is saying, Tess Holiday is saying, and say, like, okay, well, this guy disagrees and he's not being a complete jerk about it, right? He is being like, 
at least reasonable. Like I get those messages every every day now. And so that does scare me. That really does scare me. And much to the chagrin of the politically correct, obesity itself is classified as a disease because it is not only an underpinning of major chronic diseases, but a serious debilitating condition in its own right. So how is obesity a debilitating condition in its own right? Two of the biggest reasons for this are one, dangerous visceral fat, and two, mechanical issues stemming from extra weight. Also, you guys totally lucked out because I was planning on showing you these like really, really gross anatomy videos of visceral fat, but I found out it's against the community guidelines. <laughs> so if you want to um, see them, you can look them up, they're on YouTube. They're super gross though, so be warned. <laughs> Visceral fat is commonly referred to as belly fat, but specifically refers to the fat wrapped around your internal organs. We mm. all have and need visceral fat, but too much visceral fat leaks excess hormones and inflammatory molecules into your bloodstream, putting your body into a chronic inflammatory state, which results in DNA damage and majorly ups your risk for a ton of different diseases and cancers mechanical issues. The most obvious and observable reason that obesity is horrendous for your body is simple. All that extra body weight is heavy. Our bodies mm. were not designed to carry an excess 100, 200, 300 pounds. And this is, this is so, this is so true. And it's like, as someone that has been able to live a life of being, you know, morbidly obese or class three obese or, or whatever it is that you want to use and also live a life where I am not that anymore. Like I can't explain to you how it truly feels like when you when I was that big and I think about how hard things were, it felt like I had a disability because of how um, how many like mechanical issues what she was saying, but how many mobility problems I had from my weight that I no longer have anymore. And for me, I know that there are a lot of people out there that feel the same way. And, and it's frustrating to me to just by me saying, hey, there's a way out of this and you can live a life where you don't feel like your weight is hindering you has now turned me into a villain. That's very frustrating to me. And I know it's very frustrating to a lot of you guys that are watching. It's probably frustrating to Kiana because I'm sure she's dealt with it as well. It's very frustrating when all I'm trying to do is let people know, hey, if you feel like your weight is causing your life to be not as good as it could be, uh, you can change that. You absolutely can change that. And I don't understand how that is a bad thing. And lugging this weight around has serious and unavoidable consequences. Extra weight wears down the cartilage in the knees and joints prematurely. The damage increases exponentially as weight is gained because your joints not only have to deal Oof. with the extra pressure, but the increase of force during movement. According to Harvard Medical School, when you walk across level ground, the force on your knees is the equivalent of one and a half times your body weight. That means Tess at 300 plus pounds is putting 450 pounds of pressure on her knees with each step, while someone at 150 pounds is only putting about 225 pounds of pressure per step. This is why it's very dangerous for very obese people to exercise. At some point in time, if she keeps up this type of training, Tess Holiday will most likely suffer an injury to her ankle, her lower back, or her knees. As you continue to go up in weight, that pressure just continues to compound. Every minute you spend at that size, you're needlessly harming your body. This alone for me is enough to declare health at every size a myth. I could go on forever about the consequences of obesity, but there are decades of research and proof to support this already. It is very obvious that your weight may indeed disqualify you from the healthy category. Anyway, now that we've gone over that, I, w I do want to say this um, because I've heard uh, I, he I hear that talking point all the time like you're going to hurt yourself if you work out if you're overweight. I don't want that to discourage people from trying something. You know, I do believe that if you are, you know, severely overweight, probably going on a run at the start, probably not the best idea. Um, and if anything, like it's going to it's going to cause you so much stress, like and your body's probably going to hurt for so long afterwards that I don't think that's the best way to go about it. Start slow. Like if you're really overweight, a walk is a workout. A walk is still a workout for me. I go on walks all the time. 
You do not need, if you are 200, 300 pounds overweight, to go into the gym and do the same workout that someone else that is, you know, considered a normal weight is doing. You don't need to do it. A walk is good enough. And it's it's not even just good enough. I would say it's probably the best bang for your buck because you can keep that up for a lot longer than you're going to be able to keep up going on a run or keep up doing like a hit exercise. I'm not saying eventually you can't get there, but it's about being smart in the season that you're in. When I first started working out, I did the elliptical and I did the treadmill. And then sometimes I would do a stationary bike. That's what I did to lose the the first part of my weight. And I didn't feel bad about that because I was like, I'm being smart about the decisions that I'm making. So eventually I can do handstand walks. I can do muscle ups like I can now. Let's get back to Tess and how she became the gateway drug to health at every size. Many plus size women have felt held back or defined by society's often unfair depictions of bigger women. Shallow hell. <laughs> Billy? Billy? Billy! Billy! So while it may seem that Tess Holiday is famous in spite of her weight, in reality, she's become so successful because of her weight. Mm-hmm. As far as famous plus size models go, Ashley Graham came before her, but Ashley Graham still looks exactly like a typical model. With the classic 0.7 waist to hip ratio, a big butt and boobs, and no visible lumps with smooth, shiny, tight skin. Basically, her body still looks like a typical model's body. Even with Cosmo's best efforts, however, Tessa's body doesn't. Tess is lumpy. Tess has a lot of cellulite. She has back fat, underarm flaps, and ample body rolls. Tess, in some ways then, is more like the average plus-size woman than any other cover model to come before her. I remember one thing that I think it was I think it was Michelle McDaniel I think she said it in one of her videos uh, where she talked about how Tess uses the the hashtag F your beauty standards um, but Michelle was like it seems like it's more so just F your beauty standard um, because like Tess has talked about that she gets like uh, face injections, she gets lips injections, she, um, you know, her photos are doctored, her photos are edited. So it's like the only real beauty standard that she's saying F to is about being thin um, instead of all of the beauty standards. It's she, she wears a lot of makeup, she does her hair, which I'm not saying there's anything wrong with those, but those are the beauty standards, right? So it's, it's not just like it seems like instead of saying F your beauty standards, Tess is more so saying F your beauty standard, right? But it's just amazing to have a role model like Tess and actually see someone who actually looks like me, owning their sexiness and owning their curves and, and being someone that I can actually relate to in the mainstream media. And this common ground makes her incredibly influential. Why hate yourself and why deprive yourself of having the most beautiful life possible because you happen to be fat or you happen to be a different color or you happen to be whatever whatever is holding you back like (laughs) life's too fucking short for that shit these women see tess being celebrated for her beauty and think i can be beautiful too the f your beauty standards hashtag she started has grown to over 4.5 million reposts of women declaring that they find themselves beautiful regardless of what you or society thinks And they're looking to Tess for inspiration and as a role model, even going as far as to idolize her in some instances. When I was in high school and I got an Instagram, one of the very first people I followed was the great Tess Holiday. People like Tess Holiday give me and so many other women confidence. I had never seen someone who looked like me at the time, who had the same kind of body as me, rocking it. Honestly, like I had not seen that before. So for me, with this stuff, I don't I don't really have a problem. <laughs> like I don't. Like if 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 someone out there makes you feel beautiful and makes you feel like you're lovable and makes you feel sexy and makes you feel like you deserve to have love and you deserve to feel, you know, beautiful and stuff, I I don't care at all. Like not even a little bit. I just don't care. But again, it's not about beauty. Like beauty and health can be separated, you know? Health doesn't mean beauty. It just doesn't. And she showed me how to love my body. She showed me how to love every curve, every lump, every bump. And, you know, just to be happy in the body that I'm in. Yeah, she is like an icon, a pioneer of plus size. 
Oh, I'm just, I'm very proud of her. I don't know her or anything like that, but I feel like I do because I can relate to her so strongly. I still have the People's Magazine from whenever she was on the cover. That was a historic moment for me. I kept it and I've saved it all these years. I had never felt so excited and so accepted. This emotional connection to Tess on such a sensitive and personal topic means that these women are very receptive to things that Tess has to say. Which would be all fine and well if Tess limited the conversation to beauty standards and body positivity, but as we've seen, she just doesn't. I always mentioned my success, but then it would always be followed with, well, she's unhealthy or this, so. Right which I'm not. She's constantly reaffirming to everyone that she's healthy and anyone who says otherwise is just fat phobic. So when these women come to Tess seeking inspiration and to feel more body positive, they're also receiving a dose of health at every size at the same time. Because of this, Tess Holiday, as the most famous body positive influencer, as well as other Bopo influencers, have become the gateway drug to health at every size. Mm -hmm. Where you go looking for one, you often find the other. Now, that's a great point. That's a very solid point. And I would I would agree with that. Like it seems like you cannot find and I but I will say I understand why the so many of the health at every size or like the body positivity influencers or models might say this stuff all the time because they are constantly being barraged with people screaming at them saying that you're not healthy. So again, I think a lot of the reason that they are always talking about I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, w whether or not they are, you know, that's not, I don't, I honestly am I'm not trying to make that distinction here, but they probably feel like they have to, because if they don't, then they feel like they're just going to get constantly barraged with people saying that you're not healthy. And so again, I'm not saying I agree with either or, but I would say that that's probably why you hear it so much from, you know, a plus size model or whatever it is that you want to use. Now to really understand what I mean by this, it's important to take a look back at the origins of health at every size and how we got here. Hi, I'm Dr. Linda Bacon and I'm devoted to creating a global transformation that focuses on body respect. Not so I'm, I don't know how many of you guys will know this, but this is actually the author of the book, Health at Every Size. So just so you guys know, I'm sure she'll tell you guys. Not the war on weight. Hayes has been around for many years, but became more popular following the 2008 publishing of a book of the same name by Dr. Lindo Bacon, formerly Linda, who you were just introduced to. When I first started researching Health at Every Size for this video, I was actually surprised at how reasonable some of the ideas were. Health at Every Size is a movement that is basically just encouraging people to adopt good health behaviors and to forget about weight as a goal or weight change as a goal and instead just embrace the bodies that we're living in and make good health choices to support them. So this is, I've, I've read or listened to Health at Every Size. And I was, it was fascinating. I will say that. It was fascinating. There was actually a lot, and I had this feeling that I would, but there was quite a bit that I agreed with. Um, the thing about health at every size is that health is still the most important thing. Like, health is still the, the thing that is, you know, it's the first word. And so the book is a lot about being, still being healthy. I do feel like the the new uh, the new age of health at every size has certainly um, misconstrued and has twisted the meaning of what that book said at the start, um, and I do think that it's kind of I do think that it's kind of sad. Just focusing on the behaviors that lead to good health is not only the best way to get healthy, but ironically, probably the best way to lose weight as well. And honestly, there are many other reasonable and important ideas in this book that I think could be helpful for people, such as the need to practice self-acceptance at any size, the need to end weight stigma in healthcare, and the fact that crash diets, even if they do lead to weight loss, are not healthy or sustainable. If this was all the movement was pushing, it would be a good thing, but, and it's a big but. Unfortunately, these ideas are overshadowed with the need to push that fat or obesity is not unhealthy in any way, shape, or form. And what's particularly harmful about this is that it's done in a way that suggests that this is the truth according to science. Okay, so we don't have evidence that fat is the killer it's made out to be, you may be thinking, but it clearly causes disease. Does it? 
Suspend your preconceptions and a very different picture emerges. One where it's the machinery of weight stigma that needs dismantling. Some of these scientific truths, according to Hayes, are Your body size is almost 100% genetically determined and not at all under your control. Obviously, I disagree with that 100%. Weight loss is scientifically impossible. And quote, those who do succeed are statistical anomalies whose habits are akin to eating disorder behavior and extreme amounts of exercise. This one is so frustrating. So this is this is a quote from the same person, okay? Uh, because Linda um, is now Lindo Bacon, um, and he uh, uses he, him pronouns. So um, this is the same person. Um, it's frustrating because it seems like those clips that we saw before were from, I'm assuming, for, for, from a few years ago. And it seems like the... Um, the person behind Hayes has also kind of become more extreme in their beliefs, and so has Hayes. So when we see this, right, weight loss is scientifically impossible, and those who do succeed are statistical anomalies. Okay, whatever. But then it's this. Those whose habits are akin to eating disordered behavior and extreme amounts of exercise. So this is frustrating because... I deal with this, and I know a lot of you guys deal with this as well, where someone will say, oh, you're counting your calories, oh, you are doing this diet, oh, you're trying this out, or you're just being um, aware of what you're eating, and then they will say, you have an eating disorder. That's incredibly frustrating, not just to me, but I know it's also very frustrating to people that are using tracking, that are using tracking your macros, tracking your calories as a way to recover from an actual eating disorder. And so I do think that it is, um, it's just misinformed and I, I just, I just believe that it's wrong. There are no health benefits to losing weight anyway. In fact, it might be harmful to your health. Excess body fat does not affect your health. And of course, diets don't work with no nuance applied to suggest that a lifestyle change does work. Health at every size literally claims that obesity isn't unhealthy. And even if it was, weight loss is impossible. So we should all just stop trying. The best way to win the war against fat is to give up the fight. Before we continue, for anyone watching this thinking, no, 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 you have healthy size all wrong. It is not about pushing that fat or obesity is not unhealthy. According to many websites and health at every size practitioners, the issues that I've mentioned with Hayes are misconceptions. Um, they're, they're ideas that have been distorted by the internet and they're not reflective of the true benign nature of health at every size. Even YouTube's own Abby Sharp is health at every size and she has a disclaimer on her website which says, it's health at every size, not healthy at every size, a subtle but important distinction. But the more I looked, the more I saw that that was not true at all. In fact, on the official health at every size website, there is blatant obesity denial. In so, <laughs> hi, Abby. Um, so the the problem that I think that she is going to encounter, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have encountered as well, is, is that everyone, everyone has a different definition for what health at every size is, what healthy at every size is. Like, everyone has what they think it is, and they believe that's the truth. And so whenever you have, like, I've had conversations with so many people that claim to be health at every size, and I have a conversation, and they say, well, what it means to me is X, Y, Z. And that's fine. Like, I'm not discrediting what they believe. But it's frustrating as someone that's trying to understand what is this when everyone has a different rep a different interpretation of what the thing is it makes it very hard to have a conversation that spans more than just one person's thought right it's it's like okay well this person thought this and then you talk to another person and they're like well they're wrong because this is what it means and you talk to another person or you read another website and they're like well they're wrong because this is what i believe so it's really hard to have a concrete understanding of what most people believe in the faq section there's a question that says Shouldn't we be looking for a cure for obesity rather than promoting size acceptance? And their official answer not only included obese and question marks as if it were fictional, but also stated, in order to cure a condition, the condition must be defined as a disease. If we say obesity is a disease, then we must say on some level that body fat is pathological. But there is no evidence that adipose tissue is harmful to our health. Yeah, so... It was then that I realized that not only were health at every size and fat acceptance similar, but they were the exact same thing. If you don't believe me, then keep watching. 
healthatevrysizeblog.org chronicles the roots of Hayes, tracing the foundational ideas all the way back to the 60s and 70s, where a political group called the Fat Underground band together to try to infiltrate the medical establishment in an attempt to change anti-fat attitudes that, quote, perpetuated the unhealthy habits encouraged by diet culture. Fat Underground sounds like a sick underground keto group that I don't know. I don't know what they do, but if if that's not trademarked, I feel like some sort of keto clothing company should uh, should take that on because it sounds pretty sweet. <laughs> Sound familiar? 99% of the people who lose weight gain it back. 90% of those people gain back more than they lost. People, you know, women like ourselves who are forced to diet our entire lives because we're naturally fat women and who are talking about a hundred pound weight loss that is killing us. It's because it's your body's nature to be fat and that's the reason. You know you'll have no life at all until you accept yourself as the woman you are. Their motto was literally, doctors are the enemy, weight loss is genocide and the change society, not ourselves ideology was apparently the foundation of their movement. And no, that's not satire, that's really what it says. If you were to go and look up the history of the fat acceptance movement as a political group, you would actually find the exact same story as what's posted here for Health at Every Size. The history of Health at Every Size and the history of fat acceptance are the exact same. They're the same group. Most of, if not all, the foundational ideas of Health at Every Size as they exist today, can be found back then in various fat acceptance texts. Let's see if we recognize any of these ideas. Biology, not eating habits, is the main cause of fat. Health problems of fat people are not inherently due to fat, but the result of stress, self-hatred, and chronic dieting. So, okay, I, I just want to highlight this first one. So biology, not eating habits, is the main cause of fat. I do think that there are people that are naturally a little bit bigger right? That might be considered overweight. But like when we're talking about being a hundred pounds, 200 pounds, 300 pounds overweight, like I was, <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't biology. That was decisions I was making that put me in a position that I was so overweight. Okay. It was 100% decisions I was making that put me in a position that I was so overweight. It wasn't just biology. Like, I'm not a small person. I still weigh over 200 pounds. It's very hard for me to get under 200 pounds. So I don't try, you know? So genetically, I feel like it's pretty normal for me to sit at this weight. But that doesn't mean that I should be 400 pounds, which is what I was before. Like, okay, sorry. Weight loss efforts damage health, almost never succeed except temporarily, and should not be used. And actually here's a quote from a book titled Don't Diet that they listed on their website as one of their texts, which pretty much echoes the sentiment we saw earlier. There is no good reason to consider the general increase in fatness an epidemic. People are becoming taller too, but nobody talks about a height epidemic. Nor is there any good reason to consider fatness a disease. The people of the Western world are both fatter and healthier than ever before. And the experts and co-founders of Healthy at Every Size, as listed by ASDA's website, are all members of NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. Clearly, even after all these years, Health at Every Size has not come very far from its roots in fat activism. Now, as a quick disclaimer, Health at Every Size has become a huge movement today, and I am not by any means saying that all Health at Every Size practitioners are fat activists. I'm sure there are lots of Hayes professionals that practice it a lot more responsibly than what's being depicted here. And, and I agree with that. 100% I agree with that. And I think it's important. Like, I know that she is saying, thank you so much for the short order. Um, I think that she is saying, like, they are really intertwined. But I do believe that you can find people that are, you know, health at every size that aren't going to, like, basically tell you you should gain weight. Or you, you're fine at the weight that you are and you shouldn't worry about it. Like, I do think that... There are people that might consider themselves health, health at every size that might see someone that is 200 pounds overweight and work on work with them on healthier habits that will, of course, most likely result in weight loss. And they're not going to be like, oh, my gosh, you can't lose weight. Like there's a lot of people that are not fully 
um, you know, have gone overboard, I guess, for lack of a better term. And are not even aware that this is a Trojan horse for fat activism. Now, obviously, it's my opinion that it's a Trojan horse, but if the shoe fits. <laughs> So sure, you might say that everything I've listed is a misconception, but I would argue that it's a misconception that these are misconceptions and it's a ploy to seem more reasonable than it is in order to advance the goals of the movement. And at its core, Health at Every Size's main goal is to push fat activism and not health. And of course, conveniently, the more radical ideas of health at every size are what spread like wildfire across social media by body positive influencers like Tess, while the more reasonable ideas take a back seat or are stripped of nuance to the point of uselessness. You do not need to downplay the very real risks of obesity to champion the idea that everyone can take steps to live a healthier lifestyle regardless of their body size. And Amen. And the fact that they do shows their true intent, in my opinion. The impact of Health at Every Size messages being disseminated by Tess Holiday and similar is that some of her followers have been pulled into the rhetoric of Health at Every Size and now truly believe that it's possible to be morbidly obese and healthy. After I discovered Tess, it led me to discover... Um, a lot of other fat positive, fat acceptance influencers. Hi, Megan. Everyone say hi to Megan. So one of like the big points that I remember was always subscribing to the idea that I was fat, but like I was healthy. My blood work was fine. Like everything was fine. So I'm fine. I was really excited to finally feel accepted and to finally feel like my body was good and it was beautiful. My body was good and it was just unhealthy and I didn't want to see that and entering into the fat acceptance movement really made me blind to that. And the fact that Tess and other obese people receive so much hate online telling them otherwise pushes these women further into their online groups and deeper into the lies of health at every size. 100% so like I'm so glad that she brought that up because it's so true. Like when you start, and this is why it's so important to me that I'm not overly aggressive. And like, I know, I know it's not the funnest thing to watch, you know, or most fun thing to watch, whatever the correct terminology is there. But like, I, I'm not trying to be overly aggressive and make people feel worse about where they are. Because that, again, like she said, it's just going to push people further away instead of bringing them in. And that's not what I want to do. Like, I want to bring people in and show them that, hey, like, if you want to lose weight, one, I have a huge community here that isn't going to judge you and is going to be excited and will help in any way that they can. And it's not everyone that's trying, like, not everyone that's trying to lose weight is, like, these this toxic thing. Or not everyone that loves fitness is, like, hates fat people. Like, it's just not it's just not true. But I know a lot of people that are stuck in the health at every size mindset, not everyone, but a lot of people like Megan, right, that where we did the whole reaction, like they had this thought. And then once they kind of opened their mind a little bit, they realized, okay, maybe I, I wasn't correct in, in my assumptions. Fat people have to live in a world that openly hates them. They talk about solving the obesity epidemic. That means getting rid of people like me. After all, if you're obese, you're living in an obese body, you truly believe that obese people are just as healthy, that they were born this way, and that they can't change it at all. And the world refuses to acknowledge this and even shames you and pressures you to do something that's impossible. Well, then it can kind of feel like the whole world is against you. And speaking from experience, fat people do get bullied and they are ostracized in many ways for their weight. 100% true. So this, coupled with the health at every size and fat activists whispering your, in your ear that everybody hates fat people, can really make you feel like you need to attach yourself to your group. We are wired to define ourselves by those who consider in and out of our groups, something called in-group favoritism. For certain sects of the body positivity and fat acceptance movements, anyone who is happily obese is welcome in the group. However, anyone losing weight or propagating hashtag diet culture is a threat to the group and therefore unwelcome participating mm -hmm. in a diet that says you must lose weight to be more worthy is not body positive being forced to lose weight for medical reasons is not body positive um i've never seen this video but that is absolutely ridiculous 
that. I am asking you to think critically about how your participation in diet culture may be harmful to other people. Meaning that if members want to remain in their group where they've made- Oh, that was Fat Girl Flo. Oh, again, she's on like the level of Virgie Tova. I just, just don't believe anything that girl says, or that woman says. Friends where they feel more accepted and beautiful than they do in regular society, then they are under pressure to remain fat. Tess herself is very careful to make sure that although everyone knows she's living that healthy lifestyle, she is absolutely under no circumstances trying to lose weight. In her interview for the Self magazine cover that we talked about, she talks about starting to eat healthier, but feeling guilty about it. Tess worries that her fans and followers might take the shift the wrong way and is quick to clarify, I'm still gonna eat Cheetos and all of that. She understands that a brand built on self-acceptance might question changes in her lifestyle if they come across as abandoning this core philosophy. And that, that right there blows my mind. And I, I've said it from the start. I've said it from the start when I first started talking about Tess. Is like, imagine being in her position and then having a health scare or having something happen where she's like, you know what? I want to get healthy and, you know, with, with getting healthy for her will probably result in weight loss. Being afraid to do that and having to explain why you've lost some weight and, like, being afraid of what people are going to think. Like, that is so sad. And I don't mean that in a way that's like, oh, I feel so bad for her. Ha, ha, ha. Like, I genuinely feel bad for her. Like, that sucks. That is sucky. Wow, sounds like a really loving and accepting group of people ready to lynch you at a moment's notice if you so much as stop eating Cheetos. Clearly, Tess is aware that she now needs to stay obese in order to retain the love and respect of her fans. And if she ever happened to lose weight or needed to lose weight for medical reasons, she'd be in a tough situation. She'd be attacked and she would definitely be dethroned as their queen of body positivity. Because no one in this group will admit that obesity is unhealthy, all intentional weight loss is considered fat phobia, even in the face of serious and life-threatening medical concerns, resulting in a toxic culture where people have to choose between their friends and their online community and their health. Uh, making choices to become healthier were my choices, and I made those choices very aware of what would come as a result of them. I'd had this health scare. My doctor came and saw me and he revealed that I had type 2 diabetes, which I had never received that diagnosis before. And he was basically like, look, you have to lose some amount of weight in order to deal with this, or you're going to have to be just permanently on medication for diabetes, probably for the rest of your life. I held myself back. Dude, one thing I just want to say real quick is that diabetes is not a joke. Like, it's become pretty normal in the in at least in America like y the amount of people that probably know someone that has type 2 diabetes is probably off the charts but me knowing someone my sister-in-law has type 1 diabetes the amount of and I know that they're they're different but like what you have to do to care for them right insulin and all that stuff is pretty similar like the amount of work that goes into that is so large and the thing that is crazy to me and I've said this many times type 2 diabetes you can avoid it. Like, you 100% can find out you're pre-diabetic, change some things in your diet, change some things in your lifestyle, and never become type 2 diabetic. Ever. It is so possible. And I know I've, I've talked to a friend of mine, PJ. I did an interview with him on the channel. He had type 2 diabetes, and he lost weight, and he literally reversed his type 2 diabetes. Now, I understand it's not that doesn't happen for everyone, but it does happen. It's just crazy to me. Back from losing weight because I thought I was making like this political statement, right? And I was being such a rebel and that I was part of this fat acceptance movement and no body shaming and loving and accepting myself. But I wanted to belong to some sort of community and what I found was that I was being pushed out of these spaces where body positivity activism was happening. People that I really admired, other writers, body positive writers, fat positive writers, I was being asked to leave these spaces because I first of all felt that there were some scenarios where it was acceptable to want to lose weight. And, and what has happened is any plus size person who's ever lost weight in this space has been viciously attacked by this community. 
Yep. I thought that they were all about accepting yourself, loving yourself, um, you know, loving your body, no body shaming, all of these very good things. And so body positivity and the fat acceptance movement was supposed to be all inclusive, you know, they're supposed to be like these loving people, but I'm being kicked out of it. The more I was in it, the more I saw how judgmental they were. Um, the amount of... The amount, like I've said earlier, the amount of messages I get and the amount of videos that I'm sent now of people saying the same thing that's being said here is is insane. If you did decide to start losing weight and wanted to become healthy, they just like cast you out and they didn't want to have like anything else to do with you. And to be honest, I never really felt like I truly was accepted in that community. I always felt like I was faking, like I was being someone I didn't like in order to get a group of people who didn't want to see me succeed to like me. So why is it that health at every size and body positivity activists feel confident in smugly claiming that they know better? I've got science on my side and I'm happy to stand with it. Unfortunately, a lot of it has to do with the author of the book, Lindo Bacon. If you still mm -hmm. had any hope that Hayes is more rational than it seems at the outset, that hope will probably die during this section of the video. <laughs> Lindo Bacon has a PhD, is apparently a scientist, has worked in research, but their ideas aren't exactly unbiased or rigorously tested. The crux of Lindo's argument in their own words? Repeat after me, my weight is not the problem, society's problem about weight is the problem. Lindo lists eight myths surrounding obesity in the book, beginning with what is called the death by fat myth. We hear in the news all the time about an obesity epidemic and how people are dying of obesity. And what we see is that it's just, it's not, just, true. Not, it's just, it's not, just true. not true. It's just not true. It's just, just not true. true. It's just not true. <laughs> what is officially the biggest health crisis in American history? More than 200,000 doctors have backed a report tonight calling for urgent action to combat obesity. Nutritionists say obesity is the biggest threat to public health. In the last 30 years, obesity rates for kids have tripled. It can lead to a number of health conditions such as high blood pressure, liver disease, and even cancer. So the thing is, is that the argument against this, the argument against this is that basically it's all lies. It's pretty much what what the argument is it's all lies and it's all this is is propagating the um the attack on obesity or the like this this fake um this fake media driven agenda um to say obesity is bad when it really isn't which again i disagree with but when the argument is basically going to be like well all that stuff that they're saying all the science it's all it's all wrong and it's lies it's like well what do you what do you even say to that like how do you argue against that one in three American pets are now obese. Think about that. Yes, unfortunately, you have heard right. Lindo Bacon outright denies that people are dying of obesity, despite the mountain of evidence, scientific and anecdotal, suggesting otherwise. What most studies show is that people considered overweight and mildly or moderately obese live at least as long as or longer than people deemed normal weight. Again, mildly or even moderately obese is not the same as being 100, 200, 300 pounds overweight. The data are a little more complicated at the extremes of underweight or obesity, so I won't get into that here. So what Lindo is referring to... Well, that's, that's convenient, isn't it? ...to here is what's called the obesity paradox. The discovery that in some studies, overweight and mildly obese people were found to have lived as long as normal weight individuals. And in some instances, overweight people were actually found to have lived longer. The most famous example of this is a meta-analysis from 2013, which tracked 2.8 million people, um, done by Katherine Flegel. Lindo decides that this one data point is satisfactory enough evidence to say this. The science is clear, body fat is not the killer it's made out to be. But is that a true statement? Is the science clear? Does fat kill? Let's look at the facts. First off, plenty of other studies have found the exact opposite, that people in the normal weight category fare best, and for every deviation beyond that, you're shaving years off your life. 
Second, the prevailing opinion is that the obesity paradox can be explained away by various biases in the research. And the reason it's a paradox is because researchers are confused at why it would even be there, and they're scrambling to try and explain it because obesity has a long history of being correlated with so many different types of disease. I Okay, so I'm not sure if she's going to bring this up, but I, I want to bring this up myself. So one thing that um, Healthy at, or Health at Every Size, the book, uh, talks about is um, overweight like elderly people so it's been it's been shown that um, if you're if you're elderly you know like 75 years plus like you know up there in age um, it's been shown that if you are slightly overweight it's usually a better um, correlation to you living a little bit longer now this is frustrating to me because I feel like for most of us that use common sense like for most people that get to be that age when things start to go wrong and um, you know, like trying to eat becomes a problem or you, you have issues at that age, what normally happens? Usually people get very skinny and frail before they pass away. And so it's frustrating um, to see that statistic used um, for people that are, you know, super uh, elderly, because I, I truly do believe that it is a complete misrepresentation of the facts um, just to, again, drive an agenda that I do think is harmful in the long run. This has actually happened before with something called the smoker's paradox, where it was found that in some studies, for some strange reason, smoking seemed to impart some sort of survival advantage. It was shown to lower risk of death after certain types of heart attacks, as well as decrease your risk of Parkinson's and knee replacement surgery. In both instances, doctors and researchers were really trying to explain the results as quickly as they could because they knew that if this kind of information made its way into the media and got distorted to suggest that, okay, this means that smoking is healthy or obesity is healthy, that it would be detrimental to public health. Dr. Sadia Khan, a cardiologist at Northwestern University, noticed this effect in his practice. The obesity paradox caused a lot of confusion and potential damage because we know there are cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular risks associated with obesity. I get a lot of patients who ask, why do I need to lose weight if research says I'm going to live longer? I tell them that losing weight doesn't just reduce the risk of developing heart disease, but also other diseases like cancer. Our data shows you'll live longer and healthier at a normal weight. Given this confusion, it's safe to say that it's not appropriate and even dangerous to suggest that obesity doesn't kill people. The fact that the obesity paradox exists isn't sufficient to say that obesity isn't healthy, just like the smoker's paradox isn't sufficient to say that smoking is healthy. In reality, life expectancy is one data point among a sea of data points. And mm -hmm. we can't use it to say, hey, that means being obese is healthy then. And truthfully, you can't use it to say the opposite, that it means that obesity is unhealthy. It is one piece of a bigger picture. Well, and the thing is, is like, I saw someone comment this, but like, you can, you can find a study to agree or disagree with any point that you want to make. Like, you, you just can. Like, I promise you, you can find a study like she was talking about, where you can find a study that says, hey, smoking isn't really that bad for your health. But most people will be like, yeah, but that's not true. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, most people will be like, yeah, I disagree. A bigger picture that still suggests that being obese is terrible for you. Now, despite the fact that, as I've said, there's a lot to this. There's a lot to the discussion of the obesity paradox. In Lindo's book, this section is only about two paragraphs long when we remove the little nod to NAFA and fat acceptance. Meaning that Lindo wanted to leave it as if it was self-evident that this meant that obesity didn't reduce life expectancy. No mention of the biases, nothing like that. Okay, so we don't have evidence that fat is the killer it's made out to be, you may be thinking, but it clearly causes disease. Does it? Does it? Okay, so before we unpack this point, we need to stop and talk about the wording. So we don't have evidence that fat is the killer it's made out to be, you may be thinking. We do have evidence that fat kills people. We have years of evidence. We have mountains of evidence. You mm -hmm. absolutely cannot say that we don't have evidence. You can maybe say it's not conclusive, but you can under no circumstances say we don't have evidence. Not when the prevailing medical opinion is that obesity kills people. Obesity on its own contributes to hundreds of thousands of premature deaths in the United States every year, and if we factor in its contributions to all of the major chronic diseases, the number is staggering. 
It's mm -hmm. one thing to support a controversial hypothesis, to believe it to be true and to present it properly. That is totally fine. It's quite another thing to present your opinion as known fact, as if any sane person looking at the research would come to the same conclusion that you are. If you're going to put forth a controversial opinion, you need to prove it. You can't just act like it's self-evident because you're a researcher. True. 100%. This is a pattern for Lindo. I originally wanted this section to be breaking down how the obesity paradox is wrong and blah blah blah, but there's literally a not enough time given how glib and problematic everything that comes out of Lindo Bacon's mouth is. And I think it's important that we do spend some time on this because it's being done intentionally to manipulate and deceive the audience. And in my opinion, it's outright negligent to present yourself as some scientific authority and then present your opinions as known facts. And now Lindo is taking it one step further and suggesting not only does obesity not result in premature death, but that it also doesn't cause disease. If you convince a group of people that obesity is not harmful and you're wrong, you're literally hurting people. Anyway, I agree with that. Anyway, back to Lindo's main point. But it clearly causes disease. Does it? In the book, Lindo expounds on this further by saying, the idea that weight plays a large causal role in disease is also unproven. Little evidence supports that weight is the primary cause of many diseases for which it is routinely blamed, except osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, and a few cancers. Yeah, if you don't mind a few cancers, losing <laughs> your mobility, and never being able to get a restful night's sleep again without a CPAP machine, then obesity is no big deal. Well, and plus on that, like, I feel like it might not be the fat that is the, the like that might not be um, like I, I kind of relate it to say you you get shot right and, and you die and then in the autopsy um, your cause of death isn't a gunshot wound but it's because you bled out so it's like well he didn't die because of the gunshot wound he died because he bled out well okay would he have bled out if he didn't get shot Probably not, right? So he'd probably still be alive. So it's like, okay, maybe it's not the fat that actually caused the issue, but the fat came before, and that's why the issue was such a big deal, right? Where you have higher levels of obesity, you have higher levels of diabetes. You have higher levels of hypertension. You have higher levels of coronary artery disease. You have higher levels of cancer. You have higher levels of dementia. You have higher levels of degenerative arthritis, and on and on it goes. Does it? Now, before we get into this next section, we have to break down the deceptive wording again. I already showed you the 200 diseases that obesity ups your risk of getting. It's impossible to argue that obesity doesn't result in disease. But Lindo intentionally said primary cause here because cause is technically impossible to prove with epidemiological studies, which is the type of study used to track diseases and all that kind of thing in a population. So yeah, Lindo is right, it's not proven to be the primary cause, but that's more of a fact of epidemiology than it is suggestive of anything about obesity. And as a scientist, Lindo is well aware of this. So Lindo is intentionally speaking in a way so as to confuse the average person reading this into thinking, oh, well that means that obesity doesn't result in disease. And if you think about it, if Lindo stated what they meant in more plain terms, it would be a really pointless thing to argue. Yeah, of course, we can't prove that with epidemiological studies. What's your point? The point is, this whole section is meant to deceive people into thinking that obesity is not bad for you. Obesity is a leading predictor of health outcomes in the modern age, period, full stop. It's just a fact. It's a fact of epidemiology. Anyway, back to the idea that's being presented here. This idea is an offshoot of what's called the metabolically healthy obese, which is the idea that people who's, who are obese but their blood markers show no signs of insulin resistance or prediabetes or hypertension are healthy individuals despite being technically obese. This is true. There are plenty of obese people whose metabolic health suggests that they are healthy right now at this moment in time. If the definition of health we're using here is that it, health is the absence of disease anyway. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, when we look at this group and how they fare long term, it's often found that the metabolically healthy obese at some point become metabolically unhealthy. And among those who do manage to remain metabolically healthy, 
One study found that, compared with normal weight people with no metabolic abnormalities, people who were metabolically healthy obese had a 50% increased risk of coronary heart disease, a 7% increased risk of stroke, and a double risk of heart failure. While another study stated, obese persons are at increased risk for adverse long-term outcomes even in the absence of metabolic abnormalities, suggesting that there is no healthy pattern of increased weight. I just... So this is, and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier, right? Where it's like, you might be metabolically healthy right now, but it's like, right now isn't, like it matters, but what matters more is the future, right? Like how, how do you want your life to be in 10 years? How do you want, like, how, how do you want, what type of life do you want? And a lot of people, they just, they don't think that. And like, I know I, I talked about um, this woman that made a bunch of claims similar to what is being said here, but you know, that woman was 20 years old and she was severely, severely overweight. And so it's like right now you might be doing fine metabolically, but it's, it's about the future that really matters. And that's what's kind of sad to me. Plucked a couple of quotes there, but I reviewed many papers to come to this conclusion. In an interview with Dr. Arya Sharma, founder and scientific director of Obesity Canada, he agreed that someone who is obese can still be metabolically healthy, even if they're outside the normal weight range. But Sharma cautions that sooner or later, in most obese people, their weight will become a health problem. It really is no different than smoking. Not every smoker will suffer a smoking related disease, but mm -hmm. enough of them will that we need to warn people that this is dangerous. Just because you're not suffering from health problems right now does not mean that you're not at an increased risk than if you were smaller. And I think it's this flawed, metabolically healthy obese idea that has led to this wave of you can't tell a person's health by their appearance more than anything else. Everyone is all of a sudden a doctor and they think that they can look at your photos and determine your worth and your happiness and your perceived health. In many so that's what's frustrating, man, is like everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people will attach, and I don't think it's fair, but they will attach like your worth or your your beauty or whatever and then they'll attach it to health when I'm like <laughs> they're separate like it's not the same thing I don't understand why it always has to be lumped together because it's not like they are different in many instances this is true just because someone is of normal weight does not mean that they live a healthy lifestyle or that they have a clean bill of health but if someone weighs 300 plus pounds like Tess Holiday and has no plans of even acknowledging that it's a problem, then it is fair to say that your weight may indeed disqualify you from being considered healthy. And you can most definitely infer just from looking at them that at their current state, they are at an increased risk of disease. Now, does that mean you should say that kind of thing to people? Uh, no, of course not. That's really, really rude. But anyone suggesting that there is some alternate universe where being 300 plus pounds at 5'5 five five is healthy is hurting people, whether that's the intention or not. Just because your health markers are not demonstrating in this exact moment that you are not unhealthy does not mean that they will not in the future. It's mm. like fat activists just forget that we all get old. I don't know. <laughs> We are now entering the part of the video where I openly attack Lindo Bacon's character. As I mentioned earlier, oh. it oh seemed dear. to me that Lindo Bacon's presentation style was pretty frivolous and oddly unscientific for someone who's making such serious waves online. So who is Lindo Bacon exactly? Did that just say I stand against fighting childhood obesity? In November 2014, an article appeared in the Chicago Tribune titled, Can You Be Overweight and Healthy? Now, in this article, Lindo puts forth various ideas and the other doctors pretty much just take turns shutting her down. 
But the real tea happened afterwards. James Fell, the journalist who wrote the article for the Chicago Tribune, wrote an article on his website telling a little bit more of the backstory to the quote, challenging interview that he had with Lindo. And as a result of this, Lindo Bacon actually complained about this article to the Chicago Tribune until they issued a correction and then promptly tweeted. No, I don't endorse much attributed to me in Chicago Trib. Let's call for responsible journalism. James Fell then sent a reply reminding Lindo that I had a voice recording of our conversation and that the quotes were accurate and in context. Upon finding Ooh. out that he had receipts and that Lindo could be exposed, they wrote two apology emails immediately. So the reason I felt it appropriate to include this story is that it's quite suggestive of the type of person that Lindo Bacon is. And in particular, it demonstrates that Lindo has a history of making a claim and then retracting it when it doesn't paint them in the best light. The technique Lindo likes to employ, in my opinion, of course, is called doublespeak. And actually the YouTube channel, What I've Learned, did an entire video on it. Doublespeak is language designed to evade responsibility, make the unpleasant appear pleasant, the uh, unattractive appear attractive. Basically, it's language designed to mislead while pretending not to. That, dude, that dude's glasses are absolute fire, just by the way. I'm kind of jealous. Lindo is constantly making these statements that could be construed as having double meanings. The statement, little evidence supports that weight is the primary cause of many diseases for which it is routinely blamed, is intended to mean you can't conclusively prove causality with epidemiological studies, and also excess fat does not cause disease. Just like the statement, the science is clear, body fat is not the killer it's made out to be, means the link between mortality and obesity isn't as clear cut as the media portrays it to be. And also, excess body fat doesn't kill people. By speaking in this way, Lindo can simultaneously convince someone who doesn't know how epidemiological studies work that obesity is not dangerous, but also save their ass in case someone that does takes a look at this and says, well, why would you say that? Yeah. <laughs> It's a good way to say something, but then also be like, no, 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 I didn't mean that. I meant this. Especially when the link between obesity and disease is so well documented that there's not a lot of room to argue that. Period. Full stop. It's just a fact. It's a fact of epidemiology. Lindo's actions demonstrate to me that health is not the primary goal of health at every size. If this were true, there'd be no need to hide behind vague language and cherry pick data, you would fully explain your points. If only out of passion for the fact that you believed that this is true and that fat people were being, you know, unfairly vilified for something that is not unhealthy. And this mm -hmm. certainly helps to explain why Lindo's mission statement does not mention health at all. Lindo is fostering a more just world, not a healthy one. Why? Because health at every size is not a health movement. It is entirely political. Tess Holliday wants you to believe and probably wants to believe herself that she's healthy. Lindo Bacon mm -hmm. and health at every size want you to believe that obesity is healthy. And Cosmo and every other woke corporate entity don't care what you believe as long as you buy their stuff. They all have very different reasons for doing what they do, but the result is the same. People are truly beginning to believe that obesity is not very dangerous, despite the pile of evidence suggesting otherwise and the very flimsy evidence to suggest the opposite. Well, it's not, see, the thing is like, I don't even think that it's like woke corporate entities. It's literally all corporate entities. Every, every corporation exists to make money period. That's why Cosmo put her on the magazine cover. That's why the, you know, all the other magazines put her on the magazine cover. That's why the, the model agency signed her because they were like, this is a way that we can make money. It's not a, I don't think it's a, a thing about being woke. It's just about, it's more about capitalism than I think it is about being woke personally. These women find Tess and they feel validated because she looks beautiful, even at 300 pounds. Then health at every size chimes in and tells them that, well, not only can you be beautiful, but you can be healthy at that weight. Being morbidly obese doesn't mean you're unhealthy or have a problem with food. You're just built that way. And it's only diet culture and fat phobia telling you otherwise. And this is a very seductive alternative after spending a lifetime trying and failing to lose weight and 
not feeling like your body is beautiful or worthy or anything like that. And you can see why otherwise rational people can get pulled into this alternate reality where they're being lied to by health at every size and Tess Holiday. Oh my God, that was a long one. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. It was quite the undertaking, more than I thought it would be. I actually researched obesity for like two weeks before starting this video. And then I literally didn't use like any of that research in this video, so. At least I'm confident that obesity is bad for you now. <laughs> anyway, I hope to have another video out for you guys in less than like five weeks. <laughs> so I will see you in the next one. And if you are watching this far and you are not subscribed, yeah, hit the subscribe button and like, and uh, yeah. Thank you for watching. See you in the next one. <laughs> that was, man, that was a, such a good video. Again, like I said at the start, make sure you go to her channel, make sure you hit subscribe, make sure you leave a comment. Um, but I, I'm really curious to hear what people think about this. I think there were a lot of good points made. I think that the whole situation is, um, it's, 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 there's a lot of gray area, you know, and I know that I live in the gray area and some people don't like that, but for me, it is what it is. It's, um, I think that it's a very interesting topic, and I think there's a lot that can still be discussed. But again, uh, Kiana, super awesome video. Obey the warning signs, and when there are flashing lights or wigwags, don't attempt to cross until they come to a complete stop. <laughs>